Alright ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're right here at Top Level Boxing Gym and uh, we're here at our first annual Streets Will Love You Back uh, Domestic Violence Walk and we got uh, the Domestic Violence Solution Center right here with us as well, Miss Grace, who's also uh, sponsoring the event with me and my wife. And uh, you see the shirts we're doing our thing. Come on in here, Miss Kelly. Miss <laughs> um, Kelly came out, you know what I mean, to uh, observe uh, our event today. And uh, she's a reporter from her organization, which she'll speak on that in a minute. But uh, everybody know in Arizona, the two-time world champion, Rollin' the Chilla Williams, you know what I mean? He definitely, we want to give him honor for him and his beautiful wife, letting me and my wife have this event at his gym today, you know? And the day is the day of greatness, you know, where we bring great awareness to men, women across the country about this epidemic that kills day in and day out, and that is called domestic violence. And what I want to tell the world, me and my wife, we don't just celebrate or awareness for domestic violence in October. We do it 365 days a year because men, women, and kids, they get killed 365 days a year. There's no disrespect for people who might do it only in October, but our thing is, 365 days a year. Because if people only got killed in October, wow, what would the world be if we waited from January to October to make awareness? You feel me? So if you're looking at this clip, we asking everybody across the country, start making awareness in your community, in your state, every day, all day. Because they get killed day in and day out from this worst epidemic. And without that being said, I'm going to pass it over to the champ. Come to awareness for today's uh, event. Uh, they have supporters of the movement, the domestic violence awareness movement. Uh, I'd like to be happy and honored to be supported. All right, Ms. Grace. Well, I'm Grace Parker with the Agnes Center for Domestic Solutions, where we have the solution to your domestic violence situation. We want to end the violence, we want people to become overcomers. Um, Again, um, like Brother Rob said, we do this and bring the awareness every single day. I am an overcomer. I've survived it. You can survive it as well. Um, Agnes Center offers free classes, free training. Um, we have counseling on board. And our main focus is ending the cycle, not only for the victim, but the perpetrators as well. Amen. Because in order for us to end a cycle, we have to get to the root. Amen. And the root of the problem it could be they were abused when they were little. They saw their dad do it. They saw their mom do it. And we need to get to the uh, pop problem in order to have a solution to it. Amen. Ms. Kelly? Hi, my name is Kelly Kleber, and I'm a photographer for State Press Newspaper, and I'm so honored to be here with you guys today. Honored to have you. Thank you Thank very you. much. You very and much. without further ado, I'm going to bring my beautiful queen up front because I love when my wife uh, speak out because she is the one who got me on board at doing a lot of things that I do. You know what I mean? Coming from the street life that I came from, I wasn't really up close and personal. You know what I mean? I did things behind the scene. But I love that I can do things out here now and uh, be accounted for in the world now. So I'm going to bring my beautiful queen right here, Miss Lucinda. Well, we just want to thank everybody that came out today to the Domestic Violence Awareness Walk. It is our first one, so we know that every year it's going to get better, but um, you know, our goal is just to educate people, and the more we educate, the more people will be aware, and the more awareness, maybe the less domestic violence and abuse we'll have. So um, you know, just join us, hook up with us on Facebook, uh, check out our website, thestreetsdontwillbeback.com, and uh, get involved. Amen. We want to say thank you for everybody who came out to the domestic violence walk, and right now, uh, we finished the walk and now we're going to go back in the back right here and you'll see more great things happening because you'll see the speakers, you know, that are going to be speaking and they're going to be speaking out too, you know. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. We're right here at Top Level Boxing Gym right here in Phoenix, Arizona. The streets will love you back and Domestic Violence Solution and Miss Kelly in the house. We'll be right back. We want to make sure that those that are victims or in a relationship of domestic violence, that they are able to know that they are not standing alone, that there are people willing to stand with them and get them through these terrible situations. Folks, I've been at the Capitol for, for the last 12 years, and I've worked real closely with 
the coalition against domestic violence. And every year we go down to the Capitol making sure that there's policies placed that are going to protect those victims in domestic violence. And we continue to every year go with the same message and we're going to continue to do it. I invite you all to join us in that call at the state capitol. We need to make sure that policymakers, including the governor of this state, understands what an important and serious issue this is. That we cannot pretend it does not exist in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in our state. That domestic violence does occur on a day-to-day -day basis. And what we're seeing is even younger folks, younger ladies, that are involved in domestic violence relationships, that they get the help they need. But it takes a loud voice. It takes all of us coming together to spread that word, to spread that message, to make sure that those folks that are the, the victims of domestic violence are, are helped out, and those that continue to want to victimize helpless folks, that we hold them accountable, that we have tough penalties in place to make sure that one, we do the preventative portion of it, but also hold them accountable. We have, we see constantly repeat offenders that continue to want to victimize uh, folks throughout our valley. We need to make sure that not only do they get the help they need, but they're held accountable. That they're not just given a slap on the wrist and expect to uh, us to ignore it that we're not going to stand for it and we're going to hold them accountable. So I look forward to our second annual walk. I know, folks, I've, I've been involved in a lot of marches. You know, like I said at the park, you know, I've been involved in those marches with 200,000 people to those marches with 10 and 15 people. And I can tell you this, that this march and this mission will continue to grow. As we continue to educate, people throughout our community, get folks involved. Folks want to get involved. They understand the need, and they want to get involved. We need to reach out to them, get them involved, get them to be able to promote the message that we've been promoting through our one-mile walk, perhaps, or one-mile walk to the park, and let them know that we are going to continue to work on this particular issue. We're going to continue to pass the message on that we are going to break this cycle of violence through our communities by ending uh, this this silence, this silence and, and, and quietness in regards to domestic violence. So I look forward to the second annual walk. I will be back here next year. I invite you all to come to the Capitol and let's send a loud message. Domestic violence will be taken serious. We will hold folks accountable and we will let those victims know of domestic violence, they're not standing alone, we stand there with them. Thank you. I want to say thank you to the Senator for coming out and uh, being with us at our first annual Streets Don't Love You Back and Domestic Violence Walk with the Domestic Violence Solution. We're doing our thing out here to break this silence, bring awareness, because like I say, Domestic violence is 365 days a year, not just in October. We have to educate all year round. So without further ado, we're going to bring our next speaker up, Miss Arvina. She's on her way up. Give her a clap. Uh, so I'm here part of a group called Simply United Together. And what we do is community service throughout each neighborhood. Whatever we find that's something of importance, we try to attach ourselves to and volunteer our services with our members just to show that we are here, that there are things out there that people need to know about, especially domestic violence. And um, myself, I am a survivor of domestic violence. Um, a few relationships that I've had throughout the years, unfortunately, have ended in domestic violence. Uh, coming to Arizona, I've been here for about 11 years. I came here and stayed at you, Mom, at first, and was with my boyfriend at the time, and started my first day of college and pretty much got beat for not giving him my first welfare check. Uh, that day, the staff heard everything that was going on, and the first minute I got back 
to the campus, they rushed me and my kids to Sojourners, who is also here. That was the most impactful moment of my life to where I figured out it's time for me to break the cycle, learn about domestic violence, so that it's not my fault. There are certain things that a woman goes through, even men that are victims of domestic violence, that they feel is a constant cycle that they put themselves through. It's my fault. I chose them. I did something that they didn't like. That's why I get hit. Unfortunately, that's, that's not the case. It's never your fault. It's never okay to put your hands on someone else. And through the Sojourner and the domestic violence classes that they have you go through, it's a whole six months program, you learn things about yourself, things about behaviors, and how to uplift yourself, change your ways, and just get back out there and stay strong. You have to stay strong in your faith to continue on with it. So I've been doing that myself throughout these years that I've been here, and being on um, simply united together has really, you know, pushed me forward into what I hope to do later on in life, and that's to one day hopefully have my own shelter for domestic violence women and children, children older than just the cutoff limit, because sometimes those kids that are older teens get left out. My son was older, and he got left out a little bit, even though he was still with me. But there's programs out there that need to go towards those older teens, too. So with Simply United Together, we're here. We're showing our force. Absolutely love being a part of your group. And we'll be here next year as well. So thank you so much. Uh, my name is Katie. I am with the Social Care Center. And we are Arizona's largest domestic violence shelter. We're also one of the largest domestic violence shelters in the country. And we service uh, women and children. Here in Arizona, we have a couple different campuses uh, in downtown Phoenix. And our mission is to overcome the impact of domestic violence one life at a time. And we are able to do that through the community, through individuals like yourself who participate in these walks. And, you know, helping us spread the word that domestic violence is a real issue. Um, one in four women will be affected by domestic violence at some point in their lives. And I've actually been um, reading research lately that is indicating that that number is now one in three. So it is a very um, huge issue in our society, and we need to take the steps to break the silence, um, as all of the shirts say today, which I think is awesome. Um, so again, we work to overcome the impact of domestic violence one life at a time. You guys are doing that by doing things like these walks, taking those steps, raising our voices and saying that this is a huge issue and we want to stop it. So thank you so much for being here today. We are so excited to be a part of this and we look forward to future partnerships as well. So thank and, you. And uh, she's ready to share her story. Uh, Miss Bobby's story is, uh, is a tragedy like a lot of things that end in domestic violence. At the end of the day, it's a true tragedy. So welcome Miss Bobby. I don't like hearing myself. <laughs> uh, he um, basically, uh, you know, he doesn't know what he's going to do after high school, but you know, hey, get through high school and then you figure it out, right? And you know, we all end up changing our careers like three times anyway, so you know, it's a big deal. So, you know, we have a good conversation with him. Doesn't that sound like a pretty typical, decent conversation and everything? And as much as we had that conversation with him, we also watched his behavior around her. Does he respect her? How does he treat her? You know, does she, does she, you know, is he good to her? And, you know, he would come to the house and swing on the front porch, swing with her. And, you know, kind of, you know, cutesy stuff going on there. You know, of course, little sister's looking on, trying to catch him kissing and all that, you know. Um, you know, it, it, he'd come over and watch TV, you know, just kick back at the house. We'd take him to the movies sometimes. His sister worked at Arkin, so he got her in free all the time. You know, they just, you know, they did all kinds of stuff together. They, uh, you know... Took care, uh, did uh, sporting events at the school and you know, hung out and everything. And it seemed like a pretty typical dating relationship. For Christmas, he bought her a couple of gifts. For Valentine's Day, he bought her a couple more gifts. You know, the little kissing bears, the ones with the magnets in the nose. 
she was totally loving that. She thought that was so cute and so romantic. And I remember her coming home and saying, Mom, Mom, look, look what he got for me, you know. And we were sitting there playing with him and everything. Uh, you know, so a little time goes by and things seem okay. But our youngest daughter, Mookie, which her name is Virginia, she comes to us and she says, I don't like that kid, Daniel. I don't like him at all. And, you know, Mookie and Katie were very, very close. Very, very close when they were coming up. You know, uh, they, both of them have very uh, long, thick, curly hair. And they used to spend hours straightening each other's hair. And anybody that has long, thick, curly hair, you know how long that takes. So they would be doing that. And they'd talk about all the things they wanted to do. You know, they wanted to be cosmetologists. They wanted to be veterinarians. They wanted to be vocal artists. They wanted to do all these really great things that kids want to do. So they were very, very close. And so when Mookie comes to us and says she doesn't like him, you know, I, I started quizzing her. I was just like, okay, well, what's the problem? Why don't you like him? She said, I don't know, Mom. I just don't like him. You know, and I said, Mookie, you got to give me something because I'm not going to go to Katie and say, hey, Mookie doesn't like Daniel. He's out of here. You can't see him anymore. That's not going to go over real well. So Mookie says, you know, Mom, you know what? I, I just don't I just don't care for him at all. I don't like him. And so I kind of kicked back for a second. I thought, well, what's really going on here? You know, what's going on with Mookie here? And she's, you know, I kind of thought about it and I thought for a second, well, they were really, really close and everything, so maybe Mookie's really jealous of Daniel and Katie's relationship. And, you know, I kind of settled on that a little bit because she wouldn't give me any information or anything. So I basically told her, you know, okay, don't be mean to your sister, all right? Just be cool. Things will level off, all right? They won't be spending so much time together and everything. And when things level off, then they'll start including you. And she was just like, yeah, yeah, whatever, Mom, you know, it's true to a 13-year-old. So she goes on about her business now. Um, you know, just to tell you a little bit about Katie, Katie was a very quiet, humble, loving person. She would give you the shirt off her back if you asked her for it. She loved animals. She was very intelligent. Uh, you know, she just um, very uh, outgoing, but also somewhat reserved. She was very humble and quiet. She was one of those people she didn't waste her breath. So if she had something to say, it was pretty darn profound. And she sometimes she would just blow us away with some of the comments she would make just out of the blue. Now, her little sister Mookie, they were very, very close. And probably the biggest part about that is because they were so opposite. You know, Mookie, on the other hand, was very assertive, very out there, very um, going to take charge and, you know, do what she's got to do and everything, right? Well, you know, after I... Um, basically, you know, tell Mookie, you know, chill, you know, don't, don't be all over your sister or anything like that. Uh, Daniel apparently finds out that Mookie doesn't like him. And so he takes it personal. Now he's like 16, Mookie's 13, and he's having issues with it, and he's making his issues known. This is information that me and my husband did not learn about until a certain incident occurred. And so what's happening is Daniel and Mookie are going back and forth. They're bickering at each other. And Mookie's not going to back down. She don't care who it is. You know, she's very much going to be right in his face because, you know, hey, she's trying to take care of her business and whatnot. And he's attacking her, and, of course, she's attacking him back verbally and whatnot. But basically what happens is one day um, after school, Katie had uh, gotten home from school. Mookie wasn't home yet. Me and my husband were at work. And I, I don't know, how many of you have the rule in your house if mom and dad aren't home, nobody's allowed in the house? Okay, that was our rule. And I tell you what, when I go and talk to teens, they find out exactly why that rule's in place. Okay, because this is, a, this, is a, this is one of those times where Katie did not make the best of decisions. So Daniel comes over with him and, a, uh, well, actually two of his friends. So there's three of them there. She lets them in the house. Well, she, she has the game Halo. And they like to play Halo a lot and everything. So they're playing Halo, but there's only two controllers. So two of them are on the Halo game. Katie's one of them, and then one of the other kids. And then Daniel and his friend are kind of just bebopping around the house, and they make their way into Mookie's room. Okay? And they're in Mookie's room. Now, Mookie's not home, but really, do they have any business in her room? Okay, well, what he does is he takes something out of Mookie's room. And he takes his friend out to the carport who's got video capability on his phone. He takes the item. He lights it on fire while his friend is videotaping on our carport. And then they upload it to Daniel's MySpace page. And then they contact Mookie. And they say, go, go look what we did. Go check this out. Well, Mookie did. And i got to tell you, boy, she was not a happy girl. 
not a happy girl at all. She called my husband and she went up one side and down the other. She was lit. And I don't blame her. I mean, they invaded her privacy, they stole something from it, and then they burned it on top of that. And I don't know about you guys, but that definitely sounds like somebody's trying to send a message. Okay? Well, the thing about this kid is he did not get our family. Okay? Because our family does not do intimidation. We, we, we are not intimidating people. I mean, for crying out loud, how intimidating can I possibly be? You know? And we're not intimidated because we believe everybody walks on the same plane. We are all equal. I don't care what your beliefs are. Okay? We are all equal, and that's just how it is. So... He thought he was going to intimidate Mookie. Well, instead, he, you know, uh, Mookie did not go into a corner. Mookie was ready to go get a piece of him, okay? But we were trying to let Mookie know, look, you know what, this is not the way to handle this. Let me and Dad handle it. Because we were looking at it, we're going, you know what, this is not just about him attacking Mookie like this. This is all, there's, there's so many things wrong with what he did here, okay? He, he, thinking he could break the house rule, thinking he could just invade somebody's privacy, steal something out of their room, and then light it on fire on my carport. Thank God it didn't get away from him. You know, there's wood on my carport. You know what I'm saying? So we sat Katie down, and of course, you know, the first thing I'm doing is I'm like, what were you thinking? And it wasn't that I knew, that I thought for a second that she took part in what, what Daniel did. Okay? It was more or less the decision that she made to allow them in the house. Because had he, they, they not been allowed in the house, this probably wouldn't have happened. So... We sat Katie down, we talked to her, we let her know how, you know, we had these issues with everything he did, and we encouraged her to end the relationship. Do you guys all get why we only encouraged her to end the relationship rather than forbid her from seeing him? Oh, yeah, and probably be more bound and determined to do it. Absolutely. Because the thing about it is, who are we to discount her feelings for him? Okay? This is the first time she's cared about somebody, actually loves somebody outside of the family unit. So we weren't willing to take that risk. We weren't willing to push her further into his arms. So we encouraged her to end the relationship. She did not end the relationship at the time, but this whole thing that happened between, Kate, uh, between Mookie and Daniel basically was when he flipped the script on her. You know, he went from this sweet, nice, charming guy, somebody she fell in love with, to this very possessive, jealous, controlling individual. You know, he would text her constantly. Her and I couldn't go to the mall it, it, without him texting her all the time. I would tell her to turn off her phone. She'd turn it off, no problem. But when she turned the phone back on, what do you think happened? She blew up her phone. Yeah, that phone was just going off, you know. And each message was that much more um, mean. Yeah, it was that much more mean. At first, you know, it's just like, you know, why aren't you answering my text? And then he starts calling her names. Then he starts blaming her for everything. You know, it's all her fault. You know, why is she doing this? And blah, blah, blah. She, he, he, he and texting wasn't the, was, was only the tip of it, okay? He would call her all the time. You know, it, eventually, it escalated so much that he tried to isolate her from family and friends. He did not want her hanging out with anybody that was not Daniel approved. That was him, his family, and his friends. Okay, so hence, that's why he texted her like crazy when her and I were out shopping. Or when we were sitting down for dinner, trying to drive a wedge there. And it wasn't enough that, you know, he, he did that. When that wasn't working, he, cut, he pulled a couple of stunts uh, with us. Um, let's see. Um, let's see, one time he, uh, he would call the house. And actually, he'd call the house randomly. And several times, and he, it wouldn't matter who answered the door or answered the phone. You know, I answered it one time, and he says, "Do you know your daughter's a bisexual?" It's like, "Wow, really? Hey, cool." Hang up the phone. I mean, really, you know what? what again, he does not get this family because guess what? If my daughter was a bisexual, or if any of my kids are bisexual, if they're gay, I don't care. I love them anyways. I raised them. I took care of them. I brought most of them into the world. You know, I mean, come on now. So he didn't get it, so that didn't work. So the next time he pulls, and this is when we realized that the relationship starting to get physically abusive, okay? He, um, they're in an argument, and he snatches her cell phone from her, all right? Well, you know what? I'm here to tell you that is physical abuse, 
okay? Nobody has the right to snatch anything from you ever, okay? Well, he snatches her phone from her, opens it up, brings up text messaging, brings up my phone number and my husband's phone number, and says, Mom, Dad, this is Katie. I'm so sorry, but I've been a bad girl lately. I've, had, I've been having sex with older men, doing drugs, and drinking a lot of alcohol. Wow, really? Wow. You know, I mean, come on now. The first thing I thought is, man, this kid thinks we got stupid written across our forehead. Seriously. You know, because what teenager's going to, you know, wrap themselves out like that? I'm not going to do that, and I'm a grown woman, you know what I mean? So in any event, a um, little more time goes by. He managed to break, uh, break her phone in half a total of four different times over just a matter of a couple of months, okay? And she ends up ending the relationship with him. She does put an end to the relationship. And, you know, she goes on about her business. She starts doing her thing. And, you know, she's, she's back to being arcadey and everything like that, not stressed out or anything. But in a matter of a couple of weeks, he assaults her in public a total of three times. Okay? One time at his place of employment and twice at school. Okay? The two times, all three times the police were called and reports were taken. Okay? But because of the laws, as far as I understand, because of the laws, they did not take him into custody, not once. Okay? He got suspended and expelled from school and everything. But I believe people looked at it as it was just a couple of kids having some issues. Okay? It's not just that. This is not something that needs to be taken lightly at all. Because, see, we suffered, my daughter suffered the worst possible outcome. Okay? If kids are going at it and having unhealthy relationships, we need to take those things seriously. And we need to let people know. You know, like I've had people come to me and talk about, yeah, my daughter broke up with this guy because blah, 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 you know, and everything. And I looked at her and I said, you know what? Let her be. Let her be. She broke up with him because he's showing signs of being abusive. Okay? And she caught the early signs and everything. You know? I mean, I, I cannot even tell you, you know, I can't impress enough how important it is that when a child or a teenager discloses to us that we point them in the right direction, we guide them, we help them find the help that they need, we help them release themselves from that relationship, and we educate them on what healthy relationships are. And that's what we, you know, that's what we do, uh, you know, with Katie's way. That's how we conclude every presentation when we go into the schools. I'm going to leave you with one more thing. There's also a law out there called Katie's Law. Has anybody heard of Katie's Law? Okay. You're about to learn your rights because if you have teenagers, okay, or if you're dating yourself, okay, you have protection under the law now. That was not the case for us. Okay. We could not get an order of protection even though we tried. All right. We, um, uh, you know, like I said, they took police reports, but they never arrested them. But see, under Katie's law now, okay, the officer, with or without warrant, can arrest the individual, okay, that's being abusive in a dating relationship, even if it's a former dating relationship. An order of protection can be obtained, and the beauty of an order of protection is that weapons can be confiscated. What was he walking around our neighborhood with? A shotgun. Right. Yeah. So, you know, it's quite possible, had we been able to get that order of protection, which we did check that box, he had access to weapons, that those weapons could have been confiscated. All right? So there's all kinds of protection. There's three strikes version to this law. In other words, the first two times somebody is charged and convicted for domestic violence, okay? First two times it can be bled down to a misdemeanor, and oftentimes it is, okay? But the third time, provided all the paperwork's in order, it's an absolute felony. It's an absolute felony, which does require them to do time. All right, and while they're doing time, they get DV counseling because they need it. Okay, we're not all about just helping the victims. We want to help the abusers as well because I believe that a lot of people think that this behavior is normal. I mean, if you look at what's going on on the TV shows and stuff like that, I mean, some of the craziness that you see on there where, where people are just being nasty to each other. You know, it's just ridiculous, and it's so unnecessary. Uh, as as far as um, the the day home from school. Yes. Okay. Basically, uh, he was not supposed to be in school. All right. He wasn't actually supposed to be. You know, we didn't want him in the neighborhood or anything like that. 
she uh, actually had a ride to and from school that day. And um, the ride home was detained. So basically, she kind of felt like she wasn't hearing a whole lot from him or anything like that. So, uh, <laughs> that wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. So she she wasn't hearing a whole lot from him, so basically she kind of dropped her guard a little bit. And she went ahead and walked on home. She walked on home with a friend of hers, but he uh, his house came up sooner, so he went into his house and she went on the west, west, rest of the way home. Well, right in front of our house there's an alley, you know, right there. We live in a neighborhood that has alleys and everything. Well, he was laying in wait. The best we can uh, recollect is he was laying in wait in the alley. So when she came walking down to approach our house, uh, he came out of the alley with his duffel bag and everything, and right in front of our house, as she was just about to come up on our carport, or right in that area, he, um, you know, came came up on her, and you know, all we know, we found his phone in the street, so right there by our house. So we, that's why we know it probably happened there. All we know is that she ran next door because because her baby sister was homesick that day. And I, I truly believe that she knew that Daniel would have hurt Mookie too. And so she ran next door. She tried to go up over the fence and get in their backyard because she knew their dog. She, uh, he, there's evidence he pulled her down and dragged her for a little bit. And there was mud and everything. And uh, at that at that point, the best I, based on you know some of the pictures that I saw, I, I don't know if she was on her knees or what, but um, you know he shot her behind the ear, and then he put the gun in his mouth and shot himself. Oh God! Yeah. And you know I, I got to tell you the worst worst day, worst thing that could ever happen to a family. We our our family just literally shattered on that day because. What we knew is normal absolutely does not ever exist again for us. I mean, we we don't do family pictures because somebody's missing, you know, and, and how do you do that? I still haven't figured it out. I mean, people have said Photoshop and everything like that, but she's, she's not there, you know, and it's, it's never going to be the same. It's, it's not the same when um, we go up to Flagstaff because she had been accepted to NAU. Mm. You know, and so we we were really looking forward to going up to NAU and visiting her and spending time with her and doing the whole college thing with her and everything. You know, that's gone. You know, there's just there's so much she had to offer and so much she had going on that you know we feel like we've been robbed. But we've also taken our own tragedy and turned it into a positive for others, so that people can see the hindsight that we see now. Okay. Nobody else has to be in my shoes. Nobody else has to feel like I do every single day when I wake up. And the only way I can talk to her is when I meditate. You know, I can't feel her hug me. You know, I can't hug her. And it's it's devastating. It's it's hard to get through days sometimes. Do you believe in fate? My name is Marie and it's my pleasure to share my story with you today. I didn't realize I'd be sharing my story with you today, but I'm happy to do that. I'm the fourth of eight children born to a single mother in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm actually one of 25 children born to a man I never knew. When I was just two years old, I was adopted by my aunt and uncle and moved out here to Phoenix, Arizona. But we made frequent trips back to visit with my, my mother and my siblings. Just about every year we'd go back and I'd visit with my other brothers and my sister. But when I was 12, I got a call telling me that 
my mother had died. And even though I've been living with my aunt and uncle out here in Phoenix ever since I was two years old, I was devastated when I heard that my, my mother had died. And the hardest part for me was that Besides the fact that she'd given me away, she was gone. And her husband had killed her. I couldn't understand that at, at 12 years old. That's, that's a lot for a 12-year-old to deal with. I know anybody here have daughters, young daughters? You can imagine that's a lot to deal with at 12 years old. And the thing of it is that when my mother passed, my younger brothers came to live with me in Phoenix. So that brought our total to five children out here living together. It was a very difficult time for all of us because we were angry and we were frustrated. We were hurting. We just lost our mother. We didn't get counseling. Some might say it's not too late. <laughs> We didn't get any counseling or anything like that. We either kept it inside or we acted it out. I kept it inside for many, many years. My brothers, oh, they acted it out big time. My youngest brother was actually in the house when my mother was here, eight years old. It still troubles him today. He's calling me as an adult. He called me on the phone telling me, I was there. I know what happened. They killed, he killed our mother, and nobody cares. He was saying nobody even cares. He said everybody has just gone on with their lives as if nothing has happened. That's reason why I like to be here today because I know that that's not true. For many years I felt the same way that he did. Nobody cares. Nobody cares that women are beaten. Nobody cares that we're murdered, that our children are left without parents. I said nobody even cares about that. Everybody makes, you know, flippant comments and they just go on. Somebody said to me a few months ago, why don't you just leave? I was like, okay, <laughs> calm down. <laughs> but people don't understand. They, they don't realize how hard it is. So he called me crying on the phone as an adult, telling me nobody cares. And I have to, I have to hold back my feelings and my tears and, and console my brother. It's not easy. But to make matters worse, we fast forward about 14 years. I'm an adult. I'm living on my own, working, dating. I have my own apartment. Life is good. At least I think so. Life is it's kind of good for a moment. Until I get that second call. This time they tell me it's my sister. Okay. That hit me like a ton of bricks falling from the sky and just smashing. It just knocked the life out of me. I said, no, please. Not my sister. I love my sister. Out of 25 children, she was the only sister I knew. She's the only sister I've communicated with when I traveled back and forth to North Carolina. She was the only sister I knew. I said, it, it just can't be my sister. What happened? And then they tell me her husband killed her. I remember our last conversation. I was listening when Bobby was talking about, I love you. I remember our last conversation. I hadn't heard from her for a while. 
And I didn't know anything about domestic violence, even though my mother died when I was 12 years old. I didn't, I didn't know about domestic violence, like, you know, her husband killed her. And my sister, we would have intermittent contacts, and sometimes I wouldn't hear from her for a long time, and I know she moved around a lot, and my letters would come back, letters, we don't even write those anymore, but I have letters from my sister, which I, I cherish now, but my letters would come back, and I'm like, what is her problem, you know? But she called one day, I hadn't heard from her in a long time, and I'm in my apartment with my son, and I get this call, and the person says, oh hi, oh my God, who's this? She said, it's your sister. I'm like, okay. This isn't funny. I thought somebody had just playing around being funny. I hadn't heard from her in so long. I said, no, this is not my sister. My sister does not call me. She said, yes, this is your sister. She said, I've been trying to get in contact with you. I've been trying to call you. I need to talk to you. Oh my gosh, it's my sister. I'm so happy, I'm ecstatic. My sister finally called me. So she's talking and talking and we're crying and laughing and, and talking and she tells me about when she had her last child. She said, you know, I almost died. I could feel the, the life leaving me and the doctor said, what do you want us to do? She said, I need to talk to my sister. And they said, well, where is she? We'll get her for you. And she said, well, she's in Arizona. And my sister was in North Carolina. So she told the doctors her sister was in Arizona. And they said, oh, yeah, you know, she's delirious. She's kind of out of it. She's really ill. I don't know what was going on with the child birth. But she, she was out of it. And the doctors didn't believe her that she even had a sister in Arizona. She said, I kept trying to tell them I need to talk to my sister, and they wouldn't believe me. So I'm crying, and I'm so emotional about the whole thing. So we go on talking, and, you know, we love each other, and we're so happy to hear from each other. And I, I noticed that her voice sounds just like mine. It seemed like I was talking to myself. And I said, you have my voice. I hadn't noticed that before. You have my voice. She said, no, you have my voice. And I said, you have my laugh. She laughed just like I do. She said, no, you have my laugh. I'm the oldest. That didn't mean so much to me until I lost her. And I realized that I do have her voice. I have her voice. I have her voice for a reason, and we talked that last time for a reason, and we made that connection for a reason. And she knew. She never told me she was being abused. She never told me why she kept moving around, why we could never stand. She never told me. I had absolutely no idea. And to be honest, I was a little angry about that at first. I'm like, why didn't she tell me? I would have done anything to try to save her. But she didn't for whatever reason. I don't know. Maybe she didn't want the family to know. Maybe it was embarrassing. I don't know why she didn't tell me. But she called me. And I believe she called me because she saw the signs. She knew she was in a violent relationship. And she wanted to talk to me one more time. That was the last time I talked to her. The next call was telling me she's gone. Her husband had killed her. And that was, for me, the straw that broke the camel's back. No, it was the camel that broke the straw's back. Me being the straw. Because, see, at that point, I decided, I'm next. My mother, first my mother, and then my sister, I have to be next. Must be some type of 
curse or something. So they say that. Kennedy family and must be a curse. I have to be next. So I live my life that way. I always kept thinking I was next. Everything I did, everywhere I went, in the back of my mind, I'm next. I don't know who it is that's going to kill me, but somebody is. So I started relationships, you know, with the end in mind. I wasn't planning on sticking around for long. That's good for goals, you know, goals and dreams, but it doesn't work real well for relationships. But that's how I felt. Somebody's going to do it. But I finally, I finally came to realize that, you know, my, my fate was not a physical death. My fate was a slow, painful, psychological death from the inside out. I was killing myself. Everything I did, you know, my work, my play, my, my daily interactions. The effects on my family and me have been just so huge. I was relating to Bobby when she said it's never the same. It's, it's never the same. And it's been many years still. I think about my mother and my sister. Even though I had parents already, I still think about my mother and my sister, especially my sister, because I was older and that just, oh, that just hurt my heart, losing my sister. But we, drug addiction, trouble in school, incarceration, dysfunctional relationships, and more. My family, my brothers and I, we all went through that. You see, my mother was bashed in the head, right in the house with her little boy. Altered his life forever. My sister, she had that seemingly nice family. Bobby talked about the nice family. She had that, what she would look at and think was a nice family. Married, three children, you know, living the American dream. Stand up and say, no more. Somebody has to stand up for us. So I say, no more. It may as well be me. And I, there's a quote that I like by Daniel Rudy Rudiger. That says, the greatest thing you can give someone is hope. So I'd like you to know there came a time in my life that I realized I'm not my mother. I'm not my sister. Their fate is not mine. Every man is not their murderer. I do not have to live my life in pain. I can change the course of my history. I can create, actually we can create our own fate. So I thank you all for being here. I just want to begin by saying thank everybody for coming, for coming out and supporting our event today. All praise and honor to God for giving us the opportunity to speak, breaking the silence, and becoming overcomers. My story is a little different. I want to thank God for not allowing my mother to be Katie's mother. Or my sisters to be your sister. Those unfortunate situations could have easily been me. I was a victim not only once, but several relationships. See, as a victim, you do get, get out. You're stupid for staying, but there's reasons why we don't. The biggest reason for me was fear, and embarrassment. I was afraid to speak out. I was afraid because I was told 
I was worthless. No one cared. No one is going to love you like me. So I thought that was love. I thought having a black guy in there locked up in my bedroom for days was love. Until I learned different. God showed me a different way. When I was going through my situations, I wasn't saved, so I didn't have the relationship with God as I do today. And as I would think back on my past, once I became saved and got my relationship with God on one accord, I asked, I said, why did you allow me to go through that? Why me? Why did I have to have the black eyes and the busted lips and the locked jaws? And for me to forgive these people, I wasn't ready. His answer to me was, I need you to write your story. So I sat in front of a computer and I began to write. And as the book was coming to an end, I didn't have an end. I said, God, what do I do now? I told my story, but it's not over. So he placed someone in my life for me to pass the forgiveness test. And that's the last chapter in my book. I didn't have a title, but God said, you've overcome. So I entitled my book. So I thought that was my purpose, was to write my story, to get other people to understand that this is a problem. We need to break the silence. So I was good with that. Okay, I'll do this because you're directing me to. But he said it's not over because you're going to impact thousands of lives, not only women, but also the perpetrators, their animals, and their children. I'm like, okay, so how do I do that? So he birthed Agnes Centers for Domestic Solutions. He said, you're going to do this to help families. And we're going to start with this right here in Arizona. So that's where Agnes Centers came from. That's my testimony and my story. I didn't have the courage to do any of it. Uh, one, as reflecting back on one incident, and this is how God works. And it's in my book. I was standing in my kitchen sink a couple of days after I had been beat with the Bible because I wanted a relationship with God, but because one of my accusers said, where is your God, and beat me with my Bible, I turned away. I said, okay, God, you didn't help me then. So at that point in my life, I was in my early, my early 20s, I did mean, not try to go to church and bring my children up right the way they should go. And after I got beat with the Bible, I said, uh, this church thing ain't meant for me, so I decided to go back out in the world and, you know, try, try that. But this particular oh, perpetrator, abuser, or whatever, I was still in this relationship, and one day I said, enough is enough. I'm standing at my kitchen sink washing dishes, and I said, Lord, just take him away. There was no argument going on, no heated moment. It was just, I had enough. So maybe before the dishes were done, someone knocked on the door. It was two dressed police officers, plain clothes, detectives. They wanted him for rape. They had to take my car. They took him. But it was, he said, it's not that. It's not that. But apparently he had a young girl in my car, supposed to be sexual and of course, found out she was 16 years old. Her grandmother saw her getting out of my vehicle 
and took him to jail. Haven't seen or heard from him. But he did send me a threatening notice from prison that said if he ever saw me again, he would kill me. So I fled from that state. It took these many years for me to tell my story and my location because I know God has me covered. So I don't walk in fear of him anymore. So if he came from California to Arizona right now, I wouldn't fear him because I know that God has me covered. And that's where my strength came from at all times. Even when I was not saved, I knew that my help came from God. And he would show up in any situation. You just have to trust and believe that he will. If you know anyone that is in a situation right now, advise them to get help. And that's what Agnes Center is all about. We want to help both families and victims all around the table because we can't end the cycle by just saying, here's a shelter, we'll hide you for a few months, and then we're going to send you back out there because not if you're not going to get with him, you're going to get with someone that's just like him. And that's where why I was in so many different relationships, different men, different faces, but the same situation. But today, I stand here by God before me that it won't happen to me again. And I know that we can help people overcome domestic violence just by doing walks, sharing our testimonies. And I thank you two women that have the strength to speak out and break the silence. Because Arizona is one of the leading domestic violence states when I looked this state up, I saw that. There's too many victims and not enough overcomers. So I want to thank you all again for coming out. Thank you all for the support. And thanks for listening to my story and my testimony.